and uh, okay, wonderful. So uh, this is our uh, third installment, three out of four, of Anglo-Catholic Women Building God's Church. Uh, and tonight uh, we are going to be talking about um, uh, Vida Dutton Scudder. I've also heard her name pronounced Vida, but in any case, uh, you know, social revolutionary, liturgical theologian, English professor, uh, all of the above. Uh, this, is, this is who we will be meeting this evening. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to share this with you. I, I've got to know her over the last few months um, as I put together one of her books for republication. We'll talk about that a bit more. Um, so let's begin this. Everyone can see it uh, well, I hope. That's wonderful. I can't, I can't get rid of this, the notice about the meeting being recorded. Ah, no. Um, sometimes it allows you to say Press yes. got it. Look for it. It says got oh, it. I see. I didn't press I that. I didn't see the bottom of it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, don't, wouldn't want that obstructing the view of some of these uh, photographs and everything. Um, so our scene begins actually in India, of all places. Um, a man named David Coit Scudder has gone there with his wife, um, Harriet Louisa Dutton Scudder as a missionary um, with the Congregational Board of Foreign Missions. And he is swimming in a river. And very suddenly the dam breaks and his body is actually lost in the flow of things. And um, this is sort of the foundational story uh, for Scudder of her life. This is the, the loss of her father, the father she never knew. She was um, not even, I think, a year old at the time. Um, and so it, it's both, um, but also in a weird way, like an alienation from her own loss, because it's not something she remembers. She has no memory of the man. It's just this sort of permanent black hole in her psyche. You know, she even talks later in life about how difficult it is for her to pray the Our Father. Um, it's the one part of the Christian tradition, she says, that she's never connected to and has always prayed out of mere obedience because this, this loss was so striking. Um, so despite the sort of, inter, you know, uh, a beginning in India, um, her, her mother immediately takes her back to Auburndale, Massachusetts. And that is where she, she grows up. Um, she was originally named Julia as a child, but there were too many Julias around in the family. There were already two Aunt Julias. So she became named after her father, her father named David. And so she took on this name or her family started calling her by this name. Of, um, of Vida. And her first memory though, is also of loss, this time of a national loss. She says that there were all of these figures in her living room um, and they were um, suddenly talking about the death of a president, the death of Lincoln, and that this uh, was the beginning of her memory. She writes about this in her memoir on journey, which is where we'll be drawing a lot of this um, tonight. But for her, it sort of signaled that looking back, her entire life, she says, was really defined by a period of intense political international instability. Uh, I mean, what phase of history isn't, but she felt it, that this was somehow unique to her. And um, that it began here with the death of Lincoln, and then she would die very soon after World War II ended. Um, and while she lived in a time of political tumult, she also realized that she was always sort of ensconced in privilege. This privilege upbringing in Boston, and then later, um, uh, you know, the life of an English professor at a comfortable girls' school, or excuse me, um, uh, college for women. Um, in any case, the, the next memory we have is also very precious to her. She says that the most important thing happening to me during the summer of her childhood was a single solitary sight of fairies. She writes, there was uh, nothing in it to convince the skeptic, but I never forget it. At dusk, as we returned from the big house to the cottage, I saw a fairy wedding. It was in our little cottage garden and tall stalks of white phlox overarched the bride. Light enough shone dimly among the flowers to show the pretty group. 
Now, she has the uh, audacity to go take this to her, uh, her grade school and tell all the kids around, well, you know, I saw fairies. <laughs> um, it's just a natural thing that you would say, just like seeing good weather. And her teacher draws her aside and says, I know you like to make up stories, but please do not tell the other children again about seeing fairies. You and I know you are making it up for fun, and I know you don't mean to tell a lie, but they think you believe you saw them, and that would be a great pity. Um, later in life, Scudder wrote, I can say with Wordsworth, no shock given to my moral nature had I known until that moment. That was pretty much the worst experience of my childhood, for I was a truthful child. Um, this moment, I think, encapsulates so much about Scudder. On the one hand, there's this, mm, this transparency to otherworldly experiences. Um, she'll take it in a much more orthodox Christian direction later, but for the moment, this, this sensitivity to spiritual realities, this belief that you need to speak the truth, even if people don't want to hear it, and also, I think, a certain level of precociousness this is not the first uh, tension she's going to have with one of her teachers, um, her first impatience with a teacher. And then also, in a way, I think, again, we, we really have to take account of this, this privilege that ensconces Scudder's life. I mean, she says that this is the worst thing that happened to her in her childhood. Um, it's just something to note and be aware of. Uh, and it's actually again, sort of a, a strange tension in her life. On the one hand, she's sheltered, but then she also has an expansive childhood. Her mom is constantly taking her to Europe and to Rome, um, and especially uh, her journeys in Rome, she recalls with great fondness. This was a different Rome than we might know now. This is the, a Rome before it became an archeological museum. At this time, um, Scudder recalls that there was moss growing in all the ruins. People would just walk in and out of them. Uh, the, the ruins of old Rome were just lived in spaces. They weren't sort of set aside as artifacts. And so, of course, they were crumbling under the moss and stuff. But at the same time, Scudder somehow felt they were more alive, more mystical, that the past became sort of interesting that way. Um, she also sees a lot of the, the old Catholic world um, she obviously goes uh, to some of the services in Rome, which is very scandalous for a good Congregationalist family from Boston. Um, but uh, it does have an interesting effect once they go to England. You know, her mom sort of says, well, these Anglicans, they're not so bad, this Church of England crowd. I mean, it's a little Catholic, but I guess if we're, I mean, they're the Protestants. We think we're safe there. Uh, and uh, sort of gets lulled by this cathedral religion of the Church of England. So that when um, Scudder finally goes back to, uh, to Boston with her mom, um, they fall under <laughs> the influences of a very uh, famous Episcopal preacher by the name of Phillips Brooks. Uh, you can see him in this young picture here. That's him as a seminarian, or right, right around the time of his seminary education here at uh, Virginia Theological Seminary, and then uh, later on, the stalwart preacher in his robes, and, uh, you know, may, uh, this is, this is uh, what uh, I guess you become after you are, <laughs> you go through BTS. Uh, in any case, uh, she writes in her memoir, in Europe, we had naturally frequented the English churches. Her Puritan congregationalist tendencies, uh, the tendencies of her mother, yielded imperceptibly. And on our return to America, she was ready for the touch of new life imparted by Mr. Brooks to thousands. She entered the Episcopal fold and became a member of Trinity Parish. Um, now, this, I mean, Brooks was just an incredibly influential preacher of the time, and it's worth one of the things I want to do tonight is really focus on these spiritual touchstones of Scudder's biography. So a, a lot of work is dedicated to her politics, um, and that's all very important. But I just want to sort of fill in the picture a little bit tonight by focusing on, on her spiritual formation, especially because I think it will help us the most with Lent. So it's worth thinking about what sort of community she found herself in at Trinity in Boston. 
um, because this was not, uh, as you might imagine, um, Anglo-Catholicism, but it was a religion of beauty. Uh, this was the church that was under construction um, when she first uh, started going to Trinity. They were meeting in an old technology building, but this was, this was the sort of building that her community created, in a sense. And as you can see, it's, it's called Trinity. It has these three really dramatic entrances. Um, and then inside, it's just a place swarming with color and, and from this picture, light. Um, and as you sort of sort of Roman influence in the in the altar, you all know a lot more about architecture than me. But um, and you can see it's not you wouldn't stage a missile mass in this space. This is really the beginning of a sort of liturgical broad church Episcopalianism, you know. And and Brooks was at the forefront of this um, movement. People have called it evangelical Catholicism, um, broad church, I, I don't know, but it's a religion of, of beauty, um, but it's also very ethical. It, it's emphasis is on ethics rather than on dogma. Um, and you can see this in a very famous uh, quote from one of Brooks's sermons. He says, oh, do not pray for easy lives, pray to be stronger men. Um, manliness, right? That's a, that's a part of it. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. Then the doing of your work shall be no miracle, but you shall be a miracle. Every day you shall wonder at yourself, at the riches of life, which has come to you by the grace of God. So this quote is fascinating mm -hmm. because um, it really is about this sort of like do-it-yourself religion. It's a lot about becoming a good person. Isn't it? uh, it's a sort of forerunner of a, a moral deism, almost, you'd want to say. Um, and notice where he really relocates the miracle. Like, don't worry about people being healed. Like, that's not a miracle. You shall be the miracle when you do your tasks. <laughs> um, but it, it is, in a sense, it is cultivating a deep relationship of the soul with God because God's powers are being infused into the human person. And again, there's a sort of optimism about the human person that we really can do these tasks and these works and we can go into the richness of life. Um, and you, you just see this sort of establishment of a humanist paradise. I mean, there's God there, there's theology there, no doubt, but a really high evaluation of the human person and of what the human person is capable of. Um, so in any case, uh, Scudder was taken to Brooks for uh, her confirmation training. And again, another relationship with someone in authority. She gets really nervous. <laughs> she's 12 and she's stuttering. She has all these doubts about religion and, and uh, she can't even speak them. And Brooks is like, who is this stuttering 12 year old? She's not ready to be confirmed. So they make her wait two years. <laughs> um, but finally she is judged ready. And, um, and she writes, uh, after two years, I was adjudged ready, though I wasn't. And with at least an attempt at what I knew to be the proper emotions, I went to my grandmother, who was then my dearest friend, and told her what was to happen. And her reply was the second shock received by my moral nature. For very stern and straight and grave, she said, I am glad your father did not live to see this day. Such was the reaction of a Puritan gentlewoman in 1875 to the influx of fresh spiritual force which was visiting her city. <laughs> so there was a sense uh, among her family, at least, that she was yeah, betraying the family congregationalism. Um, and, you know, the... The other thing that Brooks was sort of channeling, and it really caught her mother's imagination, um, was the theology of F.D. Morris, um, who was, a, who was a, a clergyman in the Church of England. Um, and he represented what is sometimes called, you know, this uh, sacramental incarnationalism. You really see this beautifully in uh, a quote from one of his sermons, a sermon for Christmas Day. And 
Scudder talks about how Morris's books were just all over the house, that her mom was just soaking up this theology. Uh, and he says, in the flesh of Jesus Christ, there is a bond between all creatures and their creator. Um, so again, you see this, this incarnationalism, um, but this flesh of Christ is doing something in the world. This flesh of Christ is acting as a binding agent between human beings. And once we notice that the flesh of Christ is doing that, that in some, some way, my body is the body of other people and other people's bodies are under my care, um, that leads us to certain conclusions about society and about how society should work. So Morris is going to be a very early thinker in this, in this Christian socialism um, movement. He's going to, in some ways, be more conservative than what comes after. I'm sure Dr. Orens can fill in some uh, gaps here if we want to during the discussion. But he is going to, he actually, as I believe, says in a letter that, you know, well, the, the state can never be socialist. That's out of question. Um, but the church, by necessity, must be socialist in the sense that um, we are responsible for the flesh of Christ in the world. And that, that commits us to certain acts, uh, giving of ourselves, giving of our possessions, um, and sharing of those possessions among, among humankind. Um, here's another quote from him. I seriously believe that Christianity is the only foundation of socialism and that a true socialism is the necessary result of a sound Christianity. So we're gonna see a lot of these two theological influences in Scudder's life, this, this um, optimism about the human person and the human project. She's going to hold on to that optimism a lot longer than most um, of her contemporaries. She's going to hold on to it well past World War I. Um, and also this, this belief that the dogmas of the church are a precious inheritance precisely because if really unleashed in the world, they would have revolutionary consequences. Um, the other thing we know about her, and th this, this part is harder to trace, is that these relationships with the women in her family are deeply spiritually important for her. Um, and we, it's harder to know about them precisely because they, you know, they don't leave a bunch of writings around for us to read. Um, and we, a lot of it probably happened on a very day-to-day -day level. Uh, but one figure who really jumps out, and this picture is a young, uh, a picture of Scudder as a, as a young woman, um, but she talks very lovingly of her aunt Eliza Scudder. She says in her memoir that her aunt Eliza was a storm-tossed, passionate, illumined spirit, author of beautiful hymns, which are still valued. Um, originally, she also had been a great embarrassment to the family because she had slipped from Congregationalism in the 1850s to become a Unitarian. Uh, she became a Unitarian because she felt that that was a place where her liberal free-ranging mind could sort of mount a full critique against uh, the institution of slavery. Um, that the, the bread and butter congregationalism just wasn't cutting it, something a, a freer mind needed, a greater critique could be made. And, and in the 50s and 60s of Boston, that was to be found in the Unitarian church. Um, but something happens um, uh, in the 70s and 80s um, uh, to Aunt Eliza. Again, this is from Scudder's memoir. While my mother was content to um, satisfy her theological needs with Morris, Aunt Eliza's more adventurous spirit moved on, explored the region, then strange to Boston of what we now call Anglo-Catholicism. Retreats, early communions, even it was incredibly whispered, oracular confession. <laughs> Family loyalty was hard put to endure all that. And today, Aunt Eliza would, I suspect, have gone straight to Rome, but that was then a point beyond even her horizons. So again, despite the sort of, you know, ethical incarnationalism of Brooks and the sacramental incarnationalism of, uh, of Morris, she's going to get this Anglo-Catholic strain from her Aunt Eliza. Um, interestingly, Scudder 
despite being deeply interested in figures like St. Francis and St. Catherine of Siena, she, she mentions that she's never really tempted by Rome in her life. And that's probably because through her international childhood and, and seeing what was happening in Europe in the early 1900s, she knew how um, the Roman Catholic Church at that time was in a great reaction against something called modernism, this sort of exploratory theology that Scudder loved. She knew that she wouldn't get to do that if she went to Rome. So despite all of her love of, of the church here, the sacraments, the liturgy, um, she really stayed very firmly in the Episcopal fold. She writes, within my own Anglican communion, I've been able, once surrendered to its disciplines, to breathe the air I craved. Um, when she's in her, in her teens, um, her mother does take her to Cambridge. And she writes, well, first of all, she had to eat boiled Brussels sprouts for 15 days. And her mother had to intervene and say, that's enough Brussels sprouts to whoever was hosting them. Um, but she also has another really interesting me memory that shows, again, that if she was ensconced uh, in, her, in her world, in a way, it was the way that, um, that young women and women in general were ensconced in that culture, that, that they were kept separate. Um, she says, I remember how our little feminine group attended by special permission, a lecture course by the great scholar, Canon Lightfoot on the epistle to the Romans. That was long before women were welcomed even on sufferance to the university. Shyly, we made our way through the medieval hall to the Oriel where half concealed like nuns behind a grating we were allowed to harbor. So literally in order to study the scriptures at, at Cambridge, they had to be behind a grating. Um, one, uh, once we were almost late and I can still see those mocking undergraduates, those boys, those young men, on the point of hissing, glare at us as we scurried by. So I have the notes yet that I took on those lectures. And there was a, I think she felt very seriously the separation from the world, sort of closed in. You know, she, she writes in her memoir, and this she's writing um, much later in life as an, as an adult woman. She says, who was that girl who returned? Under much surface eagerness and keen power of enjoyment and anything and everything life offered, she was not a wholly happy creature. And just notice, like, that remove of language, how she started to speak about herself in the third person. But she, she's not grounded in her own reality. She's, she's calling herself she. Um, and she, she says, she was unable to find reality anywhere. The most solid phenomena disappeared as she encountered them. This sounds absurd and people may think I'm talking nonsense, yet I'm trying to present a central and persistent agony from childhood, the evasiveness of all I loved and touched and saw had tormented me. This sort of experience it was, I think, which caused my queer trick, disconcerting to my mother, of running my hands into a bed of nettles, dancing up and down with the sting. I like it so, the child would cry. Delicious, reassuring sting, witnessing to actual existence outside of oneself. So she's so hungry for reality that she's subjecting herself to these extreme, well, I, I think extreme, even though it's just a bed of metals, extreme experiences just to feel that she was in her body and was herself and that the universe existed. Um, it is a dreadful thing, she says, to feel the universe evading you whenever you need it. And her prayer during this time, it's a very moving prayer. She says, oh God, if there be a God, make me a real person. Um, well, a little bit of that prayer might have been answered by her trip to Smith College. Um, this is where she, she uh, went for this first part of undergraduate education. But, uh, and my wife, uh, Gina, is on the, on the call, so maybe she'll want to talk about Smith and what she learned about Smith in this period. Um, but uh, uh, 
because Gina went to Smith and they gave her all these classes on what it was like in the late 1800s, how it was, it, it was very much a school where, you know, you wanted women to know enough about Milton so that they could talk to their husbands and know what their husbands were talking about. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Vida has, or Scudder has this hilarious experience with another teacher, a literature uh, teacher this time. Um, and uh, she writes, the first lady placed over us in the literature classes was chosen, I surmise, because she had published a book, rather, distinct, uh, rather more of a distinction then than now. Her caliber may be inferred from the remark with which she introduced Milton. The professor said, young ladies, uh, you know, the chief work of this poet Milton is called Paradise Lost. And this is a quote, I shall not expect you to gain great familiarity with it, for it is difficult to read. Um, of course, I have read every line of it myself on a bet with one of my gentleman admirers. They bet me a diamond ring that I couldn't read the poem through, and I won the ring. <laughs> Here it is, waving her hand. <laughs> And Scudder was just like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? My mom was having me read this text to her when I was at her knee. <laughs> Scudder remembers that her mom would cover over passages that she thought were too salacious for the young child to read um, in Paradise Lost. So her, her formation perhaps uh, did not happen in class. She remembers with great fondness, you know, staying up late at night and talking with her, her friends um, in their houses. And she said it was impossible to go to bed at curfew at 10 o'clock because oh, that's just when people start discussing their great religious questions and their religious doubts. Uh, and if we go to bed now, a soul might be lost. <laughs> um, uh, so her next journey is, um, uh, she is one of the first American women admitted to graduate studies at Oxford in 1885. They weren't going to give them degrees, but they were going to let um, them go to class at least. And she went with her, um, her friend, uh, Clara French. Um, we can, we'll talk a bit more about her relationships with, um, with women at this time, but she and and French were incredibly close. And at um, Oxford, the great influence of, of that period would be Ruskin, uh, hearing some of Ruskin's last lectures. And in those lectures, Ruskin was turning to examining um, uh, these social reform questions. And that was like a lightning bolt through Scudder's world. She had ensconced herself in this uh, world of, of art and privilege, and she was realizing that all these beautiful things, these things that she thought were just so beautiful, well, they actually were very, they were very much ingrained in a culture of exploitation um, in this industrialized hellscape. Um, and you couldn't go and enjoy a painting without knowing that you enjoying that painting was only because of a function of your own uh, social stature in the world. It, it radicalized her in some ways. She didn't know what to do with these feelings at first. She just like said, oh, I'll, I'll go and help the Salvation Army. Um, she didn't develop, she hadn't read Marx at this point. That was all to come later. Um, but uh, in any case, we actually talked a bit about this last week. Dr. Orens mentioned those same lectures from Ruskin having such an effect on Percy Dearmer. So it's very interesting that these two uh, important liturgical thinkers of the Anglican communion um, were so affected by those lectures and by asking questions about the connection between beauty and justice. Uh, so she, she goes to Oxford, as I said, in 1885, um, but she uh, comes back to the States and actually gets a teaching position as an English professor at Wellesley in 1887. Um, she becomes an associate professor in 1892 and a full professor in 1910. And it's a place where she gets to pursue these questions of social reform. Um, she's interested in tracing the idea of, of social justice through the entire history of English literature. That's her, her meta-narrative in a way, um, this arc of history bending towards justice. Uh, and she also gets to put into practice some of these ideas in a fumbling sort of way. She is uh, one of these women who helps start what is called a settlement house. 
she started the Denison Settlement House in Boston. And these were places, the ideal was, that class barriers would come down, that women from really well-to-do families would um, live with, you know, in their words, the poor. Um, and just by the fact that these women were so classy and intelligent and um, they would just have an effect on these women and bring them up. So the word obviously isn't paternalistic, but maternalistic, I don't, I don't know what word you'd want to use for this sort of social reform idea. And of course, this is a lot of uh, Anglican social reform ideas that people think they can solve a lot of problems by educating people. Um, rather than making more extreme interventions into the social world. But at the same time, it was a form of sort of proto-social work. And in fact, the settlement house movement sort of declines as this practice of social work um, becomes more systematized. Uh, Scudder, though, even later in life was lukewarm about it. You know, she, she thought, well, these were fiery ideals. People's hearts were perhaps in the right place, but what was really happening? Did anything really change? Were people actually being helped or were privileged women merely seeking alleviation from their class guilt? Um, in any case, in, uh, so that, 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 that's a bit of her time at Wellesley. The other thing that I guess I should mention is that she was a very uh, fiery professor to have by all accounts. You know, when Rockefeller wanted to give money to Wellesley, she said it. I, you should not take that money. And she publicly protested and she almost had to give up her professorship several times because of the stances she would take. Um, and it was exhausting for her. She indeed had a sort of nervous breakdown around 1900 and she just had to go to Italy. And that's where she discovered Francis and Catherine of Siena. But just, uh, that, so that's the academic career. But I wanna go to those really early years, just real quick. Um, and zoom in, especially on 1888, because this was a year of great hope for Scudder. Another teaching position had opened um, at Wellesley, and she recommended uh, Clara French for the position. Clara French had, in the meantime, gotten a doctorate, actually, and so Scudder was like, well, she's much more qualified than even I am now to teach, so let's bring her on, and French moved there. And she said that she had every expectation that they would live out their lives together, um, but almost a week into French's life there, uh, French died of typhoid. Um, and Scudder wrote, my life stopped. I passed into a daze. Um, she did, again, it, it's this moment where she feels completely removed from the world, um, completely hungry for reality and human companionship. She actually talks about how she never thought that she could suffer human touch again um, after the loss of French. Um, and what she did with her grief is very interesting. She decided to join something called the Companionship of the Holy Cross, which was a, uh, at the time, a rather small group for Episcopal women. There were about 40 or 50 women in the group at that time. And they were pledged to the way of the cross and to the practice of intercessory prayer. What Scudder liked about it was that she didn't have to be around anyone to be a part of it. This was a dispersed community, as you might call it. Um, and she, they, uh, I would assume, you know, communicated mostly through letters and through pamphlets and through shared spiritual practices. Um, but that's actually what she need, needed at the time. She says, I was shrinking from the human touch and believed that I could never endure it again. But I was never meant for solitude. The society offered me at once spiritual union with others and the privacy I desired. Greatly should I have been surprised to foresee that in the far future, nearly all my tenderest relations would be found or formed within it. And in fact, her time in the companionship was a time of enormous growth for the, for the companions. Um, they actually ended up buying a, a retreat house, which is still functioning in Massachusetts. The, the companionship is still around. Um, perhaps, again, the Orans, if they're better familiarity with Massachusetts, would know, but I believe it's pronounced Adeline Rood. Um, and this is their chapel. And, uh, you know, Scudder mentions that it's a compromise between a summer camp and a convent. But they would uh, pray together. They would pray prime in the morning. 
And then they would pray uh, Compline at night and they would observe the great silence all through the evening. And they did have uh, retreat leaders such as the great Anglo-Catholic Bishop of Vermont, ACA Hall, or the other um, uh, Bishop Charles Brint, or Father Huntington of the uh, Society of the Holy Cross. But she said, oftentimes we were fine to just like leave the men alone and minister to ourselves. <laughs> so back even then, it was, a, it was a space of great agency for women, of great community. Um, it was a way that they could live out their spiritual lives together. Um, and they would spend often the summers in, in, these, in this space together. Um, the other person who, in a way, healed um, Scudder, we actually saw this picture earlier, but I left out the context of it, um, was, well, in a way, we'll just we'll put it this way. Uh, Scudder fell in love with one of her students, um, Florence Converse. Um, and Florence Converse originally started um, doing just a, uh, you know, a bachelor's at uh, Wellesley. Um, and she graduated from there in, eight, excuse me, 1893. Uh, and then she went and got her master's from there as well. And she worked with Scudder at Denison House. Um, by 1919, uh, Converse actually moved in with Scudder. They moved in together and they lived with their mothers. But then even after their mothers died, they continued to live together. And in, her memoirs, uh, Scudder writes something very interesting. Um, she's talking about, you know, she's surrounded by all this literature that shows that the highest, the best thing that can happen to a woman is that she falls in love with a man. And that, you know, that did not happen for Scudder. And so she's trying to assert the, the integrity of these relationships among women. Um, and she says, the unmarried woman need not lack the finer assets of motherhood, great her reward for the efforts and pains of spiritual maternity. I have admitted between 30 and 40 to my inner mansions, she's talking about her students, 30 or 40 to my inner mansions, a large proportion of my mind, and I have trained thousands of women besides that. And then she says, one has entered my inmost region of my power to open. And that was that was Converse. She writes, Miss Converse had for years shared my life and always except living under the same roof. Now that joy was given us and we have never been separated since. Um, and one of the scholars of, um, of Scudder and Converse's work, she writes that they built an edifice of one-to-one -one women friendships, of women families, of women's networks and women's communities. Um, this is another uh, photograph of Converse. And then uh, this is them together, closer to the end of uh, Scudder's life. Uh, Scudder died in 1954. Converse, who was 10 years younger than her, uh, died in 1967. And they're actually buried together in Newton Cemetery in Newton, Massachusetts. Um, this is a, a drawing of Scudder that actually is in the possession of the National Portrait Gallery. I um, thought you all would like to see that. And then um, the last part of our talk here, I just want to speak a little bit about um, Scudder's view of the liturgy and of the Book of Common Prayer especially. Uh, this is actually the book that I republished. Um, it was originally, um, you know, made from lectures from 1918, from notice the Cambridge Conference. Uh, I've not yet been able to find what this Cambridge Conference was. I would really love it to actually have been in Cambridge. I don't know if that would have been possible, but that this idea that she had been behind this grate and that now here she is. Um, but in any case, here are, here are some of my favorite quotes from this work. She writes, dogma is shown to be not a mass of abstract assumptions torn out of life, but a transcript of realities as encountered by the soul. Hmm. What I love about this quote is 
knowing that she had these extreme experiences of alienation from reality, that actually there's this intimacy, that the dogma is something that writes itself on the soul, that it touches the soul. And this is an abstract propositional knowledge. This is something derived from a deep experience that happens in prayer, in communal prayer. I think of her in that chapel at um, Adeline Rood. Um, I think of her in, in prayer, in this community of silent prayer. And she talks about an example of how she was led to a dogma through experience. She talks about how she had all these experiences of beauty throughout her life beauty in art, beauty in nature, um, beauty of friendship. And she says, my gosh, to, to receive all of this beauty actually feels a great deal like being loved. And to feel so loved, well, it sort of feels like there must be a lover behind that, just pouring out this abundance on all of us. And so this is how she arrives at this, this experience of the dogma of, of God. Um, and she does it through climbing this ladder of love. Um, another quote from, from this work. For the true social instinct looks not only around, but back. It unites men, not only to the comrades of their own day, but to the vast majority who have passed beyond the touch of sense, but not beyond the touch of faith. Time and space cannot bind it. It can be satisfied with nothing short of the whole communion of saints. And what I love about this is that you get the sense that from this book about the church year that to walk the church year is to walk in the footsteps of the saints. To plant your foot into Lent is to step where people like Catherine of Siena have already stepped. To, you are, you're putting your foot in a, in a space first made by someone like Francis or someone like Catherine. Um, and, you know, we would say someone like Scudder. And especially Scudder gets this, I, I think, from the old prayer book lectionary. You have to remember when she writes about the Book of Common Prayer, she's writing about the Book of Common Prayer, um, 1892. And that prayer book kept a very ancient lectionary. Um, it was a lectionary that in many cases was actually older than the lect lectionary used um, by the Roman Catholics of the time. Um, for instance, they were on, in many instances, they'd be the same on Sunday, but if there was a difference between Rome and the Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Common Prayer typically had the older reading. It was a reading from earlier in the medieval period and the Roman lectionary had something later in the medieval period. So actually the Book of Common Prayer was holding on to something very ancient. And so simply by reading these readings in the course of the year, you really got this sense that, um, that you were walking in the past of the saints. You were reading the words of the old English saints, of the, of the saints of, of the Western church in the sense. And then um, here is uh, the last quote that I have for us this evening. Um, and it's especially appropriate, I think, for our time together in Lent, headed towards Holy Week. She says, no evasion is possible. The suffering God in evident reality hangs forever on the rood of time. Remember, rood is an old English word for cross, for crucifix. So God in evident reality hangs forever on the cross of time. Our eyes behold him there. If God enters the temporal order at all, which he must, since he is love, he cannot stop short in being born or in manifesting the divine nature through deeds of might and mercy. He can stop nowhere till he perfect his infinity by bowing to defeat and death till he sounds the depths of absolute self-identification with his universe, till he bear our sins in his own body on the tree, and appeal not only to our adoration, but our compassion. It's a very, very beautiful quote. This, this idea that, and you know, <laughs> I know that uh, Dr. Kate Sonderager here at BTS would get very nervous about this idea of the suffering God. But in any case, the, this, 
this God who has crucified himself into time, um, this God who has decided for better or worse, God is going to live through all of the exigencies of our experience with us. And not just that, but he's going to, it's a, the depths of absolute self-identification, going all the way down into the dirt and death and, and loss and, and the experience of alienation. In fact, all those experiences that Scudder had of this inability to reach reality, of this being closed off, this sort of hell state, right? Where the only way she knows that she's alive is to suffer, is to run her hand through the nettles. God is going to go even into the depths of that sort of alienation so that someone like Scudder wouldn't have to be alone in that experience. And then notice also what's happening at the end, that God deserves not only our adoration, which of course is sort of the Latin word for worship. God isn't just something that we don't just see this crucified God and fall down and worship, but it raises our, it, it ignites our compassion. Something actually is dead in us. Our hearts are dead. And so God is in his incarnation and in his crucifixion is reaching into the space of the dead heart. And, and drawing out from that dead heart a new life of compassion. Actually, our compassion for one another is a preemptive experience of the resurrection, that we, we live again when we have compassion for another person. So... Yes. She asked at the end of her memoir. I didn't know that we were here. Huh? Uh, she asked at the end of her memoir, you know, have I found reality as life went on? Do I inhabit it today? Hmm? Yes and no. But I dare to say that the last word is yes. So at this time, uh, I just wanted to open it up and um, it can be a time for questions. It can be a time of sharing something that might've moved you, something you might've identified with. Um, yes. I'm impressed by the language of the quotations. It takes us back to an, another era. And I find I have to reread them. Thank you for using the contemporary wording for Scudder. Right. <laughs> yes, yes. This, this deep. Is... They're really this... deep. A mm -hmm. deep dive, a very deep dive, Christopher. Thank you. Well, and in fact, you know, some of the quotes I pulled out uh, for the presentation here in the back of the book um, that we that we republished with Seminary Street Press, we actually just drew them out into some paragraphs. And there's a heading that says, you know, readings for reflection and contemplation, because some of these paragraphs are just paragraphs that you could fall deep into, like they mm -hmm. the launching pad for a time of prayer and silence. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you sensed that in her words. Meditation, meditative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Christopher, one of the things that, that struck me is um, how her journey, her spiritual journey um, is something that um, she shared with a good many other people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it part, it's, it's, it's just the spirit of that age. And in part, um, you know, this, this, this um, journey from what you called um, ethical and sacramental incarnationalism is in fact uh, something that characterizes much of the Anglo Catholic movement at the end of the 19th century. It's not so much a movement despite these teachings, it's that these teachings point to 
this 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 deeper spirituality and um, I was very struck by that and also of course the role that John Ruskin plays um, mm, yes I think a much neglected figure and um, I go back to him again and again and um, the connection between Scudder and Ruskin is something that um, I'm now tempted to explore a bit more deeply. And Ruskin and his mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I actually, you know, when I when I was making this uh, book, one of the drafts of the introduction, you know, Dr. Sonderager left a note on it, and she said. I think you've lost sight of um, of Scudder's revolutionary. You're not showing enough of that. And again, I, I work, you know, I think that that is something that I think you'd be really well placed to bring out, Dr. Orens. You know, she believed that the the red flag of communism was the red of Pentecost. In fact, she hung a red communist flag uh, next to her crucifix. Um, I can see Jennifer going, Ugh. and that's how, <laughs> that's how a lot of uh, Scudder's um, uh, friends felt about, because he, as I said, her optimism lasted much longer than perhaps it should have. Um, even into the 20s, she was very pro-Soviet um, revolution, um, even as it became more and more evident how destructive it was being towards Christians. Um, but uh, yes, this, this is not to be lost sight of. She, she shared that with Conrad Noble. And our friend Talik, who is a fellow member of the Diocese of Chicago, uh, <laughs> who, who zoomed in, he says in the chat, biggest takeaway is that queer Anglo-Catholics have been revolutionary for almost two centuries. For how many? For two centuries. Two centuries. Right. Yeah. And there's a sense, you know, it's, it's all about which stories end up getting told. And um, I, yeah, I wonder if Talik wanted to say anything more about that, but it's very important to realize that uh, it's not a change in the church, it's a change in what stories are getting told. Absolutely, absolutely. Hi, Christopher, by the way, excellent job, excellent job. Very engaging, very thoughtful, very insightful, very educational. I loved it. Excellent job, Christopher. Thank you, Talik. <laughs> um, Christopher, I am wondering um, on the ethical side of, of the house, um, did she have any conversations with Reinhold Niebuhr? Hmm. Hmm. I, yeah, I might actually, if, if someone else knows the answer to that, that would be- uh, I've just I thrown it out there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know that uh, she was very much in conversation with, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher the name, but uh, Rauschenbusch, is that how you pronounce his name? Uh, the, the social- Yeah, guy. the social gospel guy. Um, and uh, that that was a big conversation partner. In fact, when I told you she was angry about the Rockefeller money, she wrote to, to Rauschenbusch, was like, can you believe they're taking Rockefeller money? Not knowing it's <laughs> Rockefeller money. <laughs> Let me ask you a, <clears throat> a tangential question, but it, it, I think it's, it's, it speaks to the heart of land. I would, Christopher, say a couple of sentences about why some very credible theologians may have uh, or may struggle with the idea of the suffering God. Hmm. Right. Um, so yes, this is a very interesting question. The, uh, <laughs> the, the sort of classical doctrine of God is that God is, um, is changeless. God does not change, um, which means that God cannot suffer because suffering is a form of change. It's a way of depriving us of being. When I suffer, I'm less alive than when I'm not suffering. I'm less a human being. And so it doesn't make sense to speak of God in the same way that God is less God um, because God doesn't change. So the classical doctrine of God has a sort of way that it thinks about the crucifixion, where the son, the, the person of the son has taken on the humanity of, um, uh, of Jesus Christ, that they are um, linked mysteriously, 
that they are the same person, but that the son suffers in his humanity. So the Trinitarian God does not suffer in the classical doctrine of God. Now, that might seem, in our age, we like to, we like to say things like God suffers. And sometimes even Luther in his more uncareful ways would say something like this. But at this, as I've thought about it more, um, one thing that makes sense to me about this classical doctrine of God is that my suffering, let's say someone I know is suffering, and then I come along and I start suffering too. That doesn't necessarily help the other person. Um, and, and in a way, let's say they were hurt by another person, and then I come along and I start being hurt as well. What's happened is that the person who was violent has power, not just over the victim, but over the other people in the world around the victim. So the, the, the aggressor has an immense force. And so would we really want to say that our aggressor, the person who does damage to us, also has power over God, over God's feelings? No. Do not want to say that. So the way the classical doctrine of God works, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Earl of Alexander, for instance, would say, God has a passionless compassion. It's not that he suffers, it's that God chooses to have compassion on creatures. So he's not suffering because someone hurt you and, and it, it is, he's suffering too because of the aggressor. He sees you in your suffering and chooses to orient, I mean, chooses is not even the right word. He simply is mercy. He simply is goodness. He simply is kindness and healing. And he directs himself to the creature in this way. So Scudder is going to go a bit further. And like a lot of liberal theologians, she says, no, this identification is total. God really suffers. So she is saying that he's empathetic. Yeah, it's hard to know exactly because she's not being um, systematic here. I, I, I'd say she's taking a devotional stance um, towards the cross. Um, she's not trying to give a metaphysical account of what happens in the Trinitarian life at the moment of crucifixion. I think she's trying to give a creaturely response to what it looks like from below the cross. Or is she just saying God loves? Right. Yes. 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 Love is beyond suffering. Hmm. That's very interesting. Thank you. Oh, Christopher, what a wonderful insight. Yeah, thank you all for, for sharing this time with us. Thank you for recording it. Yes. And uh, next week. Yes, Mother Orens, do you want to say a bit about what might be happening? Oh, my Felicia scheme. No one has heard of Felicia scheme. So oh, I have. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, how do you spell her last name? It's a Scottish name, S-K-E-N-E. -E. So um, she's a fascinating character, Victorian and an Anglo-Catholic. So um, she'll have some wisdom to share as well. Although she's a more difficult character in that we don't have memoirs uh, like Rita Scudder. So trying to piece together the puzzle of her life is, is a real challenge. How did you do it? <laughs> piece by piece. Um, there is a biography of hers, but it's Victorian. And these Victorian biographies are very anecdotal <laughs> and so um, some of the dates are wrong and some of the stories you don't know if they're true or not so um, it's you have to compare one story against another story and see see where that takes you so anyway I hope you will enjoy it next yeah. next Wednesday Oh, we will. Yeah. Christopher, what prompted you to write your book on Scudder? 
Well, it, she's actually, um, it, to be clear, yeah, it's not a book on, on Scudder. It's her book, and I just helped edit it and bring it out. But you, the I got well, what prompted that? Yeah, well, yeah, I just didn't want to take more credit than uh, I, I can take. But um, yes, I got very interested in her. There's actually a, a large group of Episcopalians on Twitter who talk about her a lot. And they actually started a magazine um, last year uh, called The Hour. Um, it's called Anglican Socialist Left. That's the tagline behind it. And they talk about Scudder quite a bit um, and really take her as sort of their patron saint. And so, um, and this is where I've been learning, frankly, all of my Anglican theology is from people on Twitter. It's been a really wonderful resource for me. So I realized that, you know, uh, um, there wasn't a lot out there um, immediately available. This was the most, I thought, devotional and accessible text of hers. She has more, she has other books that she dedicated to Florence Converse, in fact, that are very theoretical, talking about how the, um, the history of communism in the Christian church. So uh, this one I thought, though, could be used in parish uh, formation settings. In fact, someone already uh, messaged me and said that they are they are using Scudder's book for their young adult uh, classes. So um, I, it's, it's accomplishing its purpose in the world already, which is very exciting. Well, it's a slice of time. It's historical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank, thank you so much for your beautiful questions. Um, thank you for joining in, everyone. Uh, We'll look forward to hearing Mother Elizabeth next week, and I will, I'll see you all on Sunday. Is Good that day. our final session? Oh, um, next week. Next week. Next week. Next week. not you see us Saturday? What's Saturday? Friday. Friday. Oh, Friday. What's Friday? Friday. I mean, Friday. Friday. What's Friday? Friday is a feast day. I will see you on Friday. My see goodness. us Friday. Great. 6.45? <laughs> 6.45 yes. on Friday. Okay. God bless you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.